We're sisters, best friends, and authors on a mission to help you stoke your creative fire and live the life of your dreams. We believe that purpose fuels passion and that creativity is your secret weapon for mass construction. There's never been a better time to bless the world with your dream realized. You're listening to The Kate and Abby Show. Welcome back, guys, to The Kate and Abby Show. This is episode three, and we are your hosts, Abby and Kate. Hey, guys. How's it going? Thanks for being here. Today, we are diving into kind of a fun topic. This is going to be a fun yeah, one. Is it is. It's more fun, more chill, so grab a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or your comfort beverage of choice and just settle in for some really awesome story talk because we're going to talk about some of our favorite stories, particularly BBC series. So if you know anything about me and Kate, you know that we love BBC miniseries and just BBC television series in general. In general. Yeah. Uh, films just created especially by Masterpiece. Masterpiece Theater, Masterpiece Classic, especially <laughs> period dramas. We're a big fan. Um, and there's just so much to learn from the excellence that is BBC Masterpiece and BBC series. Mm. Usually adaptations of the classics, but a lot of them are original series, original stories, and they have so many amazing lessons to learn about writing. So we're going to kind of dive into that today. Some of our top favorites, what we have learned from them, and what we observe about them that we really, really love and that if we just, it's just unforgettable and really sticks with you and it's very impactful. It is. Yeah. We've been into uh, BBC for like, we were raised on it really. Yeah, we really were. We really were raised on, we didn't watch a lot of American television um, no offense to American television at all. There's some shows we really enjoyed too, but we grew up really watching um, BBC and Masterpiece and um, really getting into the classics. Uh, a lot of the, one of the big reasons we got into it was because of the BBC and Masterpiece and being able to see, I think that's kind of what made us like, I know it's inspired me as a writer. TV inspires me as a writer. And um, it's also inspired us to um, be better filmmakers too, even even YouTube, you know, and even um, how we tell stories because filmmaking is storytelling. Like we were were just talking about this last night. Yeah. Uh, How a lot of people are like, oh, this isn't, but that's not a book. A story is a story is a story. That's exactly. one of my it's favorite like, things Before to say. movies are made, there's an entire <laughs> thing called a script that is written. Yes, yes exactly. It is a written story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've, we've been huge fans of BBC and Masterpiece. If you don't know anything about BBC and Masterpiece, take notes on the shows we talk about because they're yes. fantastic. If you're into mm-hmm. storytelling, go look these up and check them out because y- I don't think you're going to regret it. I think you're going to really enjoy these because the storytelling is excellent. And uh, we talk about this all the time. Yeah. So we're going to dive into some of our favorites. Yes. And a lot of them are not super well-known. Like, I don't know how well-known BBC is in general and Masterpiece. Like you were saying that we were kind of raised on it. But I don't think it's super, like, mainstream or even that well-known about. Yeah. Which is a yeah. shame because in, they could in do this, such good In stuff. America, anyway. Because, yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're listening and you're in Britain and you're like, wow, well, I, I watch it all the time. Like, oh yeah, you know where it's at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we, we love it. Yeah. And it needs to be more well known about it uh, this, in this country for sure. And in so many other places. Oh yes. So let's, let's bring a little, let's bring it. Let's bring it, man. Let's um, start discussing, tearing some of these stories apart in a good way. So one of the things that we've talked about a lot with um, some of the, storytelling aspects of shows we've watched, movies, books, is how to handle a large cast of characters. Mm. And this is something that so many people, you've probably gotten this question a lot on Writer's Life yeah. Wednesday, is like, how do you handle writing a large cast? Maybe it's not a small scale story. Maybe you have a ton of characters. Maybe you're like Charles Dickens, who is like, you know what? I don't. I don't want to just write about two people. I want to write about twenty-three people, and they're you're going to follow all of them, 
It's like that is a thing and there's a right way to do it. And there's also ways to do it that feel lackluster when you're reading it. And I think film is a great way to see like, oh, wow, I feel engaged with all these characters or like mm, I feel detached from them. And we that's something we've talked a lot about with um, shows like the, um, we're, two examples. Yes. Dunton Abbey mm. is an excellent example. And that's one a lot of you have heard of and seen. Probably the most popular out of the ones yeah. we're going to talk about. It, but it probably is the most popular yeah. masterpiece. And there's a reason why. Mm-hmm. Let's just put it like that. <laughs> right. Because there are many shows that you've watched before that have large casts right. of characters in them. And you're like, I don't really know any of these characters necessarily. And... I don't really care yeah. about all of them. So many. So many shows. I've, I've literally stopped watching after, like, the first episode, if I even make it through that. <laughs> Sometimes, like, the first 10 minutes that it's like, I literally don't care about any of these characters. And some of these shows are even, like, British, like, BBC, that were just, like, stories that I was like, eh. Yeah, I'm not feeling anything for these characters. <laughs> right. But, and that makes you, like, just feel... That just makes you completely uninterested in what's happening. Mm -hmm. Because like I was talking about on the channel, like you have to know the characters first to understand why everything that's happening to them matters to them. Otherwise, it's like, why do we care? It doesn't matter to the character and I can't see why it matters to the character. Why does it matter to me? It doesn't. I can easily shut this show off. Exactly. I can easily stop reading this book. Right. I was going to say, and it's the same with books, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many books have you started reading? It's harder to continue reading a book that's not engaging, I think, than to continue watching a show that's not engaging because if you're watching something, it's like not active. Right. And you're looking at it and stuff, but But you're like, it takes more effort to read. It takes more effort to read for sure. (laughs) And so to push yourself forward through a book that where you don't care about the characters, it's just, you must be doing somebody a favor because. Right. That's just not fun. <laughs> exactly. So shows like Dunton Abbey is a success because it has so many components working in its favor when it comes to a large cast. Yeah. Because we follow so many people in that show and we care about all of them. And so let's talk about why, why that even is. I think one of the main ingredients with a lot of shows, especially, uh, well, Downton Abbey definitely has this component to it, um, is creating, like, I always call it the yardstick by which we measure the importance of everything. And that could Mm. be one character, could be a family of characters. And so I feel like in Downton Abbey, it's kind of more the family. So, like, Lady Mary and the Granthams and just their family, or the Crawleys, (laughs) Lord Grantham and Lady Grantham. And... That kind of creates, like, you first get to know them, and you get to know who they are and why what's happening matters to them. And then it kind of branches out from there into the household and the servants and the people in the village. And But it all, especially in the first season, it all connects to, and even through the rest of the entire show, it all connects directly back to them. And Lady Mary is kind of the main character, I would say, mm. because she's like the most iconic. Character. She's really the but, the first one at the very beginning of season one. I mean, yeah. even the as you kind of roll into the scene of the house and it's morning, and you're kind of the first person you're other than when you're like zooming through the servants' quarters a little bit. You're like kind of waking up in, with Lady Mary in her right. bedroom, yeah. like seeing her get up, seeing her open the curtains, and so you you immediately have this like little bit of attachment, like oh. She's going to be the character that I'm, like, attached right. to because I'm already, like, in her, seeing things through her eyes kind of. Yeah. And we learn in the first episode that, like, the whole uh, reason for what's happening with her is, like, why it's important to her. Right. That she has to, you know, marry someone. Yeah, really. She, she's the, one of the main components in the inciting incident of the yeah. whole show, which is, okay, the heir to Dunton Abbey... Yeah. Allegedly just perished on the Titanic. Right. And she was going to marry him. Mm -hmm. So now what's going to happen? Yeah, exactly. So she's a a big component in the inciting incident. So it pushes everyone outside their comfort zone. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) For that inciting incident. Um, And so, like, it's fascinating because, like, so we have these main characters, 
but we also have like the downstairs main characters of like, you know, Mrs. Hughes, Mr. Carson and Mrs. Patmore and Daisy and all these other and Branson and Thomas and all these people were following that we are like constantly visiting these characters and Anna and Bates who became like huge characters, pivotal characters in the entire story that all these characters are interweaving with the people who actually live in the house and everything like that. But we, we care about every single one of these characters. Yeah. So like, what are, what are some of the components that make you care about so many people? Yeah, it is really fascinating. I think that like one of the biggest things is rooting it all back to the main characters, but also giving you a sort of like a backstage look at these other characters' lives because like you know things about like Bates and Anna and Mrs. Hughes and Mr. Carson, all these people, you know things about them that the other characters don't know. And so you kind of like see some of their private lives and their emotions that they don't show necessarily to all the other characters. And so you have kind of this intimate connection with them right away that nobody else is privileged to have. So like as the audience, you already have this kind of this relationship going on with this character because you follow them into their daily life and you follow them into their personal struggles and you get to see like what are the things that they're maybe keeping a secret from other people. Which actually the thing behind the thing there is what you always talk about is you're seeing a little bit of what drives them. Right, exactly. What their desires and their fears are. Yeah, exactly. And so they're all kind of having this internal conflict built off to the side. Mm -hmm. And even if it doesn't like... Even if, you know, Gwen's typewriter escapade <laughs> becoming a secretary in the, in the first season, um, if that, even though that doesn't like directly impact Lady Mary, it still it direct, it directly impacts Gwen, obviously. And it ends up having kind of like a little uh, side plot later on in the series, which is cool. But it also impacts Sybil. And it has, like, these different components that it has these different connections to certain characters, but ultimately you care about Gwen because you got to see her internal conflict. Mm. And so even though she's a character who only, I think she's only in season one and then she leaves. Can't remember. I think yeah, I so. so. And then she comes back later as, like, a reappearance thing. Um, but all these characters, it's just interesting to see um, these characters, like, you see their private lives, you see you have like kind of an intimate connection with them because you get to follow them into do you get to follow them and you get to see their thoughts that they don't necessarily share with other people mm -hmm. in the show so you kind of feel like you are you're omniscient but you're also connected to a lot of different characters right so so kind of like in a nutshell really like how to make us care about a large cast Sh show us some of their personal struggle and make it feel personal. Yeah. Um, show us what some of their desires and fears are and we'll connect with them. Even if you have like 20 people, yeah. you know, so I can, I can, you know, in Dunton Abbey, we meet all the, everyone in the servants quarters, everyone who lives in the house. And we, that's a huge amount of people, but we kind of, uh, to some extent care about all of them. Um, because of their desires and fears and also how what they're doing is affecting the main characters, right? Yeah. I mean, so that's that's kind of like the ultimate way to handle a large cast. Yeah. Which then you also see in our, on our second example of, of um, the show, Mr. Selfridge. Yes. I love Mr. Selfridge. Oh, my gosh. That's one of my favorites. Definitely one of my top three favorites, like Downton Abbey, Selfridge, and then the other one that we're going to talk about later. <laughs> Leave you hanging on that. Yeah. But, yeah, that Selfridge, they do such a good job. And, again, there it is. The It begins with the main character, obviously. You know, it's, it's kind of telling you in the title who it's about. <laughs> mm -hmm. it begins with Mr. Selfridge, and you don't really follow anybody until he starts taking on staff for his store. And then you start to follow the lives of the staff. I think you follow, you might 
follow Agnes because you see Agnes at the very beginning when he goes in the store before he makes his store and he sees Agnes. All right, um, but even then you're seeing her because he goes into the store. Yeah, but yeah, you're seeing it through his eyes right. and then she doesn't return until later when it matters to him. And so it's like it all matters. Everything that's happening, at least in the first episode, matters to him. And all of these characters are coming in because he's kind of the agent who's pulling them into the story. Right. Which is really interesting. Yeah, and I, I, I love that. And it makes you care. So he, exactly, because you care about him, and now you care about why they matter. Yeah. Because they matter to him. And then again, you also follow them into their private lives, and you see something a little bit more than what most people see. Mm-hmm. And you see, you get to know their secrets and their struggles, whether it's an internal struggle or a physical struggle. Um, and that just makes you feel more connected to the characters which they did so well with just all the direct how it impacts everybody and how it's relevant how it's like such a flawless example like with agnes towler's backstory and her struggle with like her dad and all her family issues that are going on trying to make men's ends meet and also look after her younger brother and that whole struggle and how it directly affects the main character, Mr. Selfridge, because of his own backstory is just flawless. Yes, yes, yes. Flawless. It's so good. It's, so good. it's like, uh, ultimate, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I thought that was such a flawless example, number one, of backstory affecting something that's presently happening yeah. in the story, but also like being able to take a... a, a slightly secondary character and make and just tie that into their story as well you know what i mean yeah for sure i love that um yeah i love that subplot and and you again it's like it can kind of like branch off a little bit and i know we've talked about this before um but sometimes it can go wrong in a story when you are kind of it's like the friend of a friend of a friend syndrome I think I would call it (laughs) Mm -hmm. when it's like a character that relates to the protagonist, but we're not going to talk about, we're going to talk about them for a while, but then we're going to talk about a character that relates to the character that relates to the protagonist. And so, and then you like start going farther down the road. Usually it happens in shows where, um, they are like running out of ideas and they have to keep the show going when it's like season eight (laughs) and we've already said we don't everything know we don't know what to do yeah exactly and then it's like okay well we can make this subplot about the sister of the friend of the character that is directly related to the protagonist and now it no longer even matters to the protagonist right literally what that person does what that character does does not matter to the protagonist anymore and so, so that you can, find yourself not interested that can be the 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 benchmark by which you measure yeah is does it matter to the protagonist still? Yeah. And it's fun to even like make a, one of those little graphs that's like the spider web kind of thing. I don't know what what they call them, but like when you have like a circle and then like lines drawn to other circles. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you just have to like make sure it doesn't ever go so far away. The connection isn't so far away from the protagonist that you're like, oh, wait, nobody cares about this now. Right. So that's something that I, f- I feel like they did a good job in Selfridge. Of they didn't have... They didn't get too distant from the protagonist. Like, they always really followed him throughout the f- all four seasons. Even though right. season four, I thought, was kind of a letdown. Yeah. But it still followed him, so it wasn't, like, too bad. <laughs> right. As some shows that I've seen that it's like, oh, my gosh, you're wasting so much time on these other characters that we right. don't care about. Um, so, yeah. I feel like we're going to branch off and talk about um, something about Poldark. Yeah, so we could kind of talk about that. First, let's talk about like Unless downside. Unless you had more to say about No, Selfridge. no. Let's talk about the downside because it ties in perfectly to what right. you were saying with getting too far away. So do you want to take, take yeah, that one? Yeah, I think, I think um, a good example of the connections getting too far away is in the show Poldark, which I love. Katie loves. We love this show. We love this show. It's, <laughs> it's one of our all-time all time favorites. It's so favorites. exquisite. It's so exquisite. For numerous reasons. Mm, just everything about it. Um, but the first Brilliant two seasons, yes, the first two seasons are by far the best. Um, and even season three was pretty good. But then in season three, it started to get off on what I'm describing here, which is 
going following characters who are related to a character related to a character related to the protagonist. So now we're getting off talking about we started the show with um a very tight cast. Yeah, very very small cast and um really just following Ross Poldark, who's the main character, and how he it really opens I th- I think it's a really great hook too. It's a really good example of a good hook cuz it pulls you into the story right away. Mm. Um, like I was hooked the minute I saw that and it wasn't just from Aiden Turner's face, (laughs) (laughs) but like when it opens with him on the battlefield in Virginia and then he obviously gets injured, he goes home two years later, it's like everything happens really quickly, escalates very quickly. It's like your father died. Okay. Your state's in ruins. And, um, your your ex your girlfriend is now married to someone ex-girlfriend. else. Your ex girlfriend. <laughs> you didn't know this, but it she's like now your ex girlfriend, yeah. and she's marrying your cousin. And it's like it all happens in the first six minutes, and that's so. Is cool. it really the yeah. first six minutes? Wow. Yeah. So like for everyone, like oh, how long do I have to wait for the inciting incident? Yeah, there. Not long. Just to watch that first episode. Not long. And it's so cool because it just like turns his life upside down in the first. Five minutes right. or six minutes, <laughs> technically. Right. And, and yeah, so it's like it starts out as what I would kind of consider a small-scale story. Yeah. Like you're really just following him as a character and the, a very few, like very tight-knit group around him. Yeah. And then as time goes on, it – slowly branches and gets it grows more yeah. arms more and more arms until right. you're quite a distance away from right. the protagonist and what's necessarily affecting him and that's when it starts to become a stretch for your interest yeah exactly like when i said in season three it starts to go downhill because it's like following you're very closely following like morwenna who is the kind of girlfriend but not really of Demelza's brother. So it's like Ross's wife, Demelza, has a brother who has a crush on this girl, and we're going to follow that girl everywhere. Which I know that she ended up being like, you know, oh, we're bringing her in as kind of like a pillar character, but it felt more unrelated. It's hard to bring in and force a pillar character, though, when it's someone we did not start out with. Yeah, it is tricky, for sure. two seasons in. You can do it, It can happen, but it's... Yeah. In a certain way. Yeah. I feel like careful with that. Yeah. And I feel like a a TV show like that, that's like longer, like not a mini series, but like an ongoing series. It's more difficult to do that than like a film or a book. Right. Like a one shot thing. Um, Because unless you're like, because you don't, it's not like being brought in super quickly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like. If it's in season three, we've already like lived years with these characters. Right. Like the years are supposed to have gone by. And now it's like, oh, suddenly we're going to be following somebody else who's like has four different, like you have to connect four different dots to understand how they matter. But there they are. We're going to follow them a lot. Not that I didn't like this subplot, but I kind of didn't. <laughs> yeah. I think like to bring it to a book example, uh, using my own book series here, The Blood Race, um, I kind of experienced a little bit of that with um, the third book, Resurgence, yeah. bringing in Lara as a point of view because she was a character that you didn't connect with at all for the first two books, which are, you know, not skinny books there it's a lot of literature that you're not connecting with her at all there's nothing about her really except a fleeting mention and then I'm like hey you know I'm going to bring her in as a uh, uh, point of view in fact the first point of view that you start the whole book out with through her eyes but um so I think what made but her- you also have kind of like a theme going on with like right. with your series that like each book you kind of introduce a new character. Uh, yeah, because wasn't for sure. like Finn got a point of view in the second book? 
Yes. For the first time. Yeah. Yes. So but Finn was like so theme. relevant in book yeah. one that it was kind of like, yay, right. we finally get to have his point of view because we already kind of wanted that in book one anyway yeah. um, because we felt so close to him. So it felt very natural. Whereas Lara was like, surprise, we don't even know who it is in the prologue. We're still trying to figure it out. But the th- what what made it work was that number one, there was kind of a cool surprise attached to her right. being there, which I won't go into a lot of in case some of you haven't read it and you don't want a spoiler. Um, secondly, her being Finn's sister. So immediately, hugely impacted if you I knew that anything. that was the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> that too, but how it, how it happens, I guess. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, you're right. It is part of it. It's hard to, it's hard to talk about stories without giving spoilers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but... Because she's Finn's sister and because we know so much about Finn because he was in the first two books and she immediately impacts his backstory, which is a huge component of what drives him and also causes him a lot of pain and internal conflict. We now care about her because she was so involved with Finn's eternal conflict and we care about Finn because he affected the main characters and became a main character himself. Right. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely, I feel like he's a main character. Yeah. Especially after book two, it's like... He's just as important as everybody else. We all love Finn, right? <laughs> so the other thing I really love about Poldark too, and you see this so exquisitely done in the first like three to four episodes of season one is the pacing is like phenomenal. Some yeah. of the best pacing I've ever seen in any film or series. It's so well paced. And what's amazing is when you stop and analyze, if you know, if you know the series, you know what I'm talking about here. Not a lot happens. Some things happen, but not nearly as much as um, what takes place in the span of a single episode in later seasons of the show. There will be a ton going on and like smuggling and things getting blown up and people attacking, all this stuff. But in the first like few episodes of season one, it's very like intimate with just small day-to-day life events. But we're, we're actually more intrigued, at least I am, than in hugely all these action sequences in other shows yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So like the pacing, it's a great example. Yeah, it is. And it's also interesting because the first episode, it seems like a lot happens, like how it opens with, you know, him first coming back from war. And then it ends with like him having made all these decisions and like Elizabeth has gotten married and like all this stuff has happened. And, you know, he meets Demelza, he hires Demelza, and then like he decides to stay and like reopen the mine. And it's like a lot of decisions happen in that short period of time. So even though it doesn't feel rushed, a lot does take place at the beginning. And I know I've talked about this on my blog before, but um, I love that flow because a lot of people tend to, a lot of writers tend to like take their time with the opening of a story and like really build things up very slowly. And it's like gradually building towards the climax. I am not a fan of that. I'm a fan of like, if you're going to make something happen that's important and that is engaging, make it happen quickly, like as soon as possible and not like in a rushed way, like you were just talking about with pacing, Um, but just in a way of like cut to the chase, like let's see the good stuff. (laughs) If you have something good to show me, like let's see it now Um, and just get right into the thick of the action and the conflict, especially the internal conflict with the characters. Because that is going to, first of all, just engage you more at the very beginning. And then the trajectory can slow down a bit from there. Because I feel like it does kind of slow down a bit from there. And then mm-hmm. like less happens. But then in like later seasons, like season five, it's like they're cramming a lot of subplots into one episode. And that's when it feels cramped. Right. And that's really what I was trying to say is what you articulated really well a moment ago. Is that it's not even so much that not a lot happens. Quite a bit happens, but it happens in a way that feels so non-rushed and well-paced that it almost feels like, of course, that just naturally happens. And it it, it feels like almost not a lot is happening because it's so well-paced that nothing feels like, oh, 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 rush, rush, rush. It's it's not cramped at all. Yeah. And I feel like that's, um, 
that's something that can you can get carried away with when you're writing a bigger cast or when you're bringing new characters in later and following them now and it it starts to be less engaging because you're cramming so much in Mm -hmm. and you have less time with the characters that you really love right I feel like there was less time towards the end so towards the later seasons there was like less with Ross and Demelza. Right. And it was more, more like about how the Ross and Demelza were that, helping other people. Right. It wasn't really about their internal struggles. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that when you lose that, you start to lose the reader or viewer's interest. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that I know we were talking about earlier was the factor of having a more kind of morally gray hero right. for your story. And I would say that Poldark falls into this category as well as Selfridge. So both of them really do this really well. Is like having a character that you love, a protagonist you love, but you also kind of hate him at the same time. Right. He does a lot of things that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't stand you. Just go jump off a cliff. And sometimes you like want to scream at Ross and like just you're so angry at him for what right. he does because he does make big mistakes and he does things that are not necessarily good sometimes. But at his heart, at his core, you see that he's a good person. Same with Mr. Selfridge. Right. Is that he's he does a lot of things <laughs> that are morally gray. And you're like, wow, this guy is it's kind of a jerk. But <laughs> he's also like extremely lovable. Mm-hmm. because he has you see these qualities of like well he's a good person and mm-hmm. he like is empathetic and he wants to help people and same with like Ross he like you especially i always think of the scene where he goes to and deals at the judge <laughs> in the mm-hmm. court that day when he's trying to get his friend um out of his friend get ar- gets arrested for poaching and so he's like trying to get him off the hook and he gets like really fired up at the judge and mad at the justice system. And you see in that scene how he is so driven by justice, by truth and justice. And he has this good, kind heart that he really just wants to see justice prevail and see the right thing done. And he wants to do the right thing, but that's why it's even so much more of an internal struggle um, and difficult, even like, um, just like more engaging to watch and more, not stressful, what's the word? It's like agonizing, more yeah. agonizing to watch because you know he wants to do the right thing, but right. he's like messing up big time and you're like, oh my God. But it's so <laughs> interesting because right. you still love him and you're still right. cheering him on even after he makes mistakes. Right. Like you, he never loses your loyalty, you know? Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. because And again... Because we know what his desire is. Yeah. His true desire is what makes us connect. Yeah. So even when they make mistakes, it's like, well, we can connect with that because we are at our core good, but we make mistakes sometimes too. So, hey, I can relate with that. So that, that, that really answers a lot of questions a lot of writers have about, hey, you know, how do I... How do I, do I have to make my hero be like this squeaky clean, angelic, right. heroic, um, That's actually flawless a turn off character <laughs> for me. Exactly. Well, no. I find that annoying because it's like, nobody's like this. Mm-hmm. This is unrealistic to just have them be like this angelic character. Right. From beginning to end. And, and it, it doesn't offer the opportunity for a character arc. Like I've talked about my videos right. and on my blog. And that's the thing too, is it shows you don't have to start out with someone who's like an actual villain and then they right. become a hero. Yeah. It can be someone who's like, Hey, you know, here's what I want, but I'm not really sure necessarily how to be that person that I want to yeah. be. And their transformation then becomes them blundering, making mistakes, doing the wrong thing. Eventually, reaching the place where they are reaching their true desires. Yeah. I, th- that also made me think of, when you said villain, made me think of how both these shows, actually, um, the Poldark and Selfridge, both have excellent villain characters. Like, can we just talk about that for a minute? <laughs> yeah, their villains like, are fantastic. Oh, my gosh, so good. And I, I would love to just, like, do a whole, like, breakdown and discussion about villains. We but should. I, I know I talked about 
Poldark. I used I used the um, Poldark as an example. Comment for, below if you want a villain uh, a villain period. If you want a villain <laughs> episode, yeah, because that would be that would be a cool breakdown. Yeah, that would be, and we could like do villains from a bunch of different shows and books. Yeah, that would be fun. We should do that. Um, even if nobody wants it, we'll do it anyway because <laughs> I want to do it. Uh, but no, like so uh, for Poldark. George Religan is the villain, and I used him as an example in one of my videos about writing an unforgettable villain and why it's just so, um, how to do that, how to pull that off, using Poldark as an example. And I feel like one of the biggest things is that's going on in the show is like this really int- intricate rivalry. And it's like this direct like connection between these two characters. And I think that's what makes it like one of the things that makes it so engaging is because you can see like this torment. George goes through this torment of like he wants to just completely destroy Ross so badly. And he has a reason behind right. it. It's not just. And that's what makes it like really compelling because you can almost mm-hmm. empathize with George. Like even though he's a bad character, you can almost, you could like understand why he is the way he is because mm-hmm. of his desire, fear, and misbelief. And so like even though he turned out so bad. And another thing that is really cool, I think I talked about this in the video, is how Ross and George are actually extremely similar mm. in personality. Right. And how they're both like very outgoing, very ambitious, very, um, just extremely similar in personality. I mean, they even talk about that in the show. <laughs> yeah. And, um, right. George really admires him in a way and like wants to be friends with him and kind of wants to be like him, but also like hates him for that reason because he's like kind of, a, there's like, yeah. this comparison, there's this rivalry. It's just, it's so delicious. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. So, it's such a multi layered yeah. cake of internal conflict. Yeah. It it's so well done, yeah. Like, and that's another thing about villains is like you have to understand their desire, yeah. fear, misbelief, and where it came from. And like, if it you can't don't just be, have oh, that, this is the bad guy because oh, there needs to be a bad guy because he's bad. Yeah, he's a villain because he's a villain. Guess what? what? Nobody's like that. Wow. What? You know, that's a revolutionary yeah. thought. There's not a single person who is doing anything evil and corrupt who was born that way. Yeah, <laughs> there I'm is so- a reason why. So you know. If you're going to write a realistic villain, there has to be a reason why. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I saw a cool um, post on, I think it was a Tumblr post, but I never see it on Tumblr. It's always on Pinterest, of course. Um, I saw it on Pinterest and it was, I'm paraphrasing, but it said something like, the best villains are the villains that when you see them, you could imagine, you can see how in other circumstances, they could have been a good character. Like I thought you were going to say they could have been the hero. Yeah, they could have been the like, hero. Basically, that's what it was it's saying. It's true. It's like in other circumstances, if they made different decisions, they could have been the hero. And I'm like, ooh, that's good. That is good. Because that's like that. And that makes you really think about, well, what? how did they get to be this way? Because they weren't just born right. bad because they have to be bad because the villain has the, the, and the protagonist has to have somebody to fight. Like, that's just lame. Yeah, there needs to be a reason behind it, and it and it shouldn't be like oh the the you know, uh, the, you know, like the the bad villain and the great hero. It's like no, actually, you know, I think they did a great job of showing, like George actually making some choices where he flounders a little bit and is yeah. like could have done the right choice. You see him definitely get more corrupted right. as time goes exactly. on. Exactly, and then the same with Ross. Like yeah. you see when he you know falls off the edge a little bit and makes a bad choice. And the thing is, is that like. Everyone has, like, in the show, like, has pieces of, like, good and bad mixed together, yeah. like, in their decision-making processes. Right. So it makes it more interesting than, here's my squeaky clean hero and here's my, you know, evil corrupt villain, because that doesn't feel like real life. Right. It makes them so much more human. It does. When you can see that they have good and bad. Exactly. And they make mistakes, but they also they also do good things, and they're good good at heart. Right. Um, and yeah, it makes it so much more believable and it helps you to connect with them better. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's so good. <laughs> so much, so much there. Yeah. Just go watch Full Dark. I mean, especially like the first two seasons, like you got to watch the first two seasons. Right. Because I love they're how awesome. they are awesome and they're just a great example of like 
tight-knit, small-scale story slowly evolving into a larger cast. Mm -hmm. And same with Selfridge. Yeah. Both really good. Yeah. And um, on the topic of small-scale stories, two more. Two more we want to hit on. Yes. So the Mm -hmm. Durrells in Corfu, which actually just finished up, what, this past uh, few months of airing the final season of that show. Um, uh, we had, we, I discovered it late. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I would always see it, it on before pull dark. I'm like, yeah. what is this I just, show? It looks so <laughs> weird. Yeah. So I discovered it last year and watched it. I'm like, oh, you got to watch this show. It's so funny. And, um, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. It's, it's such a, <laughs> it's a great show. Uh, really funny, great, like in quirky very quirky sense of humor and that's definitely what i like is like quirkiness for humor yeah but it's a great example beyond that and beyond its mind-boggling film making like uh, oh my gosh like if we're gonna talk about mind-boggling cinematography (laughs) oh man yeah just incredible like if if you don't even like the show just watch it and like fast watch forward it on mute yeah watch it on mute and watch the cinematography <laughs> because it will boggle your mind yeah yeah it is just beautiful. perspectives and it's like oh look you know here's an owl flying and here's the you know jerry who's one of the the main characters like 12 year old boy standing there wa- watching the owl and then suddenly you are the owl and it's like filmed with like a gopro and you're flying at the kid and landing on his arm and i'm like yeah. Who does this in filmmaking? Yeah, it's brilliant. It, it is. was, and and so using that as to part of what tells the story and makes it unique is yeah. one of the beauties of filmmaking that is you know hard to hard to Sidebar. tackle in, <laughs> in books, but actually you can do it in books yeah, if you, yeah, you if can. you get unique with your descriptors and your point. And of that's views another thing. And, like I know I've talked about this. I talked about this in my uh, pacing and description video. But like a great way to like amp up your. Uh, description abilities, description writing abilities is like go find movies and TV shows that you love something about the cinematography or how it's shot and you know that that was intentionally written into the screenplay and then go read the screenplay and see how it's written because a lot of times I think it's it can be confusing when you like watch a movie and you're like, oh, I wish I knew how to write that down. Well, somebody wrote it down before it was a movie, so right. it was actually written before it was a movie, even if it was never a book. It was a screenplay, and the screenplay was written, it was designed to show the directors and producers what this is going to look like. Right, so like, if you want to show your reader what okay. it looks like. So, like, insert that one from Dunkirk, because that yeah. fascinated me. So a lot of you have seen the movie Dunkirk, obviously hugely popular and successful film, opens with a bunch of soldiers standing in the middle of the street with paper falling from the sky. And that is described in the screenplay as papers falling like snow. That's all it says. Like, and then it goes on to dang. like, you know, the six and guys walking down the street. But yeah, just papers falling like snow. It I'm gives like, you oh, that image. You need I, so few I words. See it. Yeah, I see it in just four words. So you, it really less is more. And it's also cool because I won't rant about this too much, but like <laughs> when you're reading a screenplay, um, generally it is known that each page of a screenplay counts for one minute of screen time. So it takes you one minute pretty much to read the page, um, takes you one minute to see it in a film. Um, if it takes you a little bit longer to read it, that's just because you're reading it a little bit slower. Everybody has a different reading pace. But it's just interesting to see how many words did this screenwriter take? How many words did they use to make one minute go by? And that can just be a really good gauge for, especially movies that, you know, you like the pacing and you, you feel like it's extremely natural feeling. Um, or even writing in slow motion. Mm. How do you write in slow motion? Well, there's yeah. a way. <laughs> right. How do you write a montage? There's a way for that too. And so it's it's a film can be incredibly helpful to study and studying screenplays. If you can get it side by side, it's even better. If you can be looking at the screenplay while you're watching the film and just studying it, breaking it down for yourself and seeing, okay, well, how do they pull that off? How did somebody, how did a writer somewhere first write this scene down to make someone see it? Mm. Because that's what you want to do as a writer. Yeah. Oh, I'm not writing a film. 
You want people to see it like a film in their head, right? uh, (laughs) You are writing a movie that is being projected on the screen of someone's mind. Yeah. And I feel like so many people get excited. Well, maybe not like the purest purists, but I think most readers get excited when they see that that a book they love is going to be turned into a movie. Not because like, oh, I can't wait to see what that looks like. Yeah, because but like, I have no I mental wait. image of yeah, exactly. it at all. But it's like, like, I can't wait to see it like come to life in an external force, right. really, um, in front of me. That's not my imagination because you already know how right. it's going to look. So if you didn't have like any mental image of anything and you couldn't see anything that was happening in the, in the book, you wouldn't really be excited about the movie, right? And, and then you wouldn't be disappointed when you're like, oh, that's not yeah. how I pictured him to look. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No one would even care. They'd just be like, that was a good film. Yeah. So it's all visual. Circling back to the Durrells, um, small scale stories telling. So what I love about this story, and this ties really on, on really, the bunny trail, no, it was a great bunny trail, and it made total sense with what we're talking about here. Um, Abby, just uh, your last video was about the inciting incident and how it doesn't need to be like, and the inciting incident is that you know a meteor crashes or that you know the bus crashes or the plane crashes and we're on a desert island or the apocalypse happens and a lot. Okay, okay, well. Um, I'm not writing about anything like big and adventurous or survival-esque like that. So how do I make my inciting incident interesting? You don't need a big, massive, freaky inciting incident. What I love about the Durrells is the inciting incident is literally they move to Greece. (laughs) <laughs> period and that's basically yeah. where the the foundation of the story begins yeah. and ends yeah on something as simple as here's a family that's kind of dysfunctional and funny and they live in england and they um i guess you could also kind of pin the the moment when she takes jerry out of school she gets right. angry she takes her kid out of school because he she feels his creativity is being crushed along with his soul and she's <laughs> like you know what we're moving to greece and, and that's the inciting incident. It's a very small, nothing exciting about it at all. But, but it's really cool because you can see why it matters to her and like why she decides to do that, which they all kind of, all the plot points kind of mush together in that first opening act. So sometimes I call the hook the inciting incident. Sometimes I call the first plot point the inciting incident. It's a little confusing. Just try to keep up. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, we would generally look at the moving to Greece as the inciting incident. If you're going to get super technical, it'll probably be like the first plot point since she made the decision and then they move. Um, but I feel like the thing that really like, it, it pushes them all outside their comfort zone for sure. Right. But the thing that like pushes her outside her comfort zone first is like the realization of like, wow, my family is so unhappy and I'm so unhappy. And what are we even doing? <laughs> right. That we're all just like struggling and surviving basically. And is this, is this our life? And so she has kind of like this moment and you like see her going through this internal conflict really of right. like, what are we going to do? Are we just going to continue down the same path or step outside our comfort zone, <laughs> do something different? The and impossible choice. Yes. It's the impossible, it's the impossible <laughs> choice. There's her impossible choice yeah. is that, and you don't see a lot about her. So it's not like, you know, some super like, it doesn't go super deep into the choice she has to make, but you do see her struggling with the choice. Yeah. Which actually, it's a great example too of how you really don't need like loads about a person to connect with them. Like you feel connected to Louisa within the first like three minutes of the film because you're like, yeah, I get where this lady's coming from and I see what she's dealing with. And that's one of the beauties of small scale storytelling is it can be just stuff taking place in yeah, your and own just mind, like watching, stuff within your own home. And yeah. you're like, yeah, I know how that is and how it feels to feel like, you know, uh, stuck and like you're not even moving forward. Yeah. And you connect with that. Exactly. I don't even think that she talks much in the beginning. It's just no. kind of like this observation of like watching her habits and right. it's just, it's cool because you get to know a character without even knowing without them having to explain anything right to you or exposition info dumping you don't really need any of that exactly you just need to observe by observing you see who they are just like with real people if you observe them long enough you see who they are right and you really don't have to see that much to know like oh okay yeah i i i I get where this character is coming from yeah and um 
Yeah, so it's like such a small inciting yeah, incident. But it, yeah, it's like you get to know the characters, and yeah. then you're like, when they move, and I actually want to talk about this because it's just a great example of comedy, but not right now. I mean, like in the future in a video. <laughs> it's like, I want to talk about this. Katie leans back. <laughs> okay. It's like, settles in for a long pause. <laughs> <laughs> sipping my mason jar of water but like how you get to know all the characters first and then because you don't know like a ton about them but you know their personalities you know that you know she has one unteachable child one vain girl one psychopath and larry <laughs> <laughs> exactly and- <laughs> described basically exactly like that in the show and so then you like you're like oh my gosh this is gonna be hilarious <laughs> to watch them all like yeah. get shoved outside their comfort zone and so then it becomes hilarious and you're predicting the hilarity because you know right. these characters personalities exactly um but yeah literally like beyond that not much really happens right it and really it just doesn't. kind of like our adventures in greece but it's yet it's so engaging because right. of the characters and and what happens is very minor yeah like what you would call probably plot points right yeah. So like, okay, Margo wants to go sunbathing on the beach over there. And just like the little tiny small scale, like, okay, here's what happened when I did that. And, you know, Jerry going and looking for otters in the stream and like very small things, not much happens, but yet you're like very intrigued. And because of the character development, it's all hilarious and interesting. Right. Yeah. And you can't wait to watch the next episode, even yeah. though hardly anything happened. <laughs> but there's like this, it, there's this feeling of like forward motion, even right. even in the mundaneness, because you know that these characters are actively seeking right. happiness or their idea of happiness. And so you kind of, as you get to know them more, you get to see like what their idea of happiness is, whether it's, you know, Jerry making a zoo for himself or it's Louisa trying to find love again. It's like you you know what these characters want. And so as you're following their adventures, you're like, oh, I wonder if they're going to get what they really want. I wonder if they're going to accomplish their goal. And so it it is more of a slow paced story, but it becomes more engaging because you have this thing that keeps, you keep returning to their goal. There's always something their motivation. moving. Right. Yeah. Their motivation is moving the story ever forward, even with not a ton of stuff going on. So if you're a contemporary writer or, um, you know, into literary fiction, you're like, well, there's not a lot happening. It doesn't need, there doesn't need to be a lot happening. It's all about the character development, the internal conflict, and um, us knowing that about the character. And that's what's the, the driving force, the thing behind the thing, moving the story forward. Exactly. Small scale storytelling also leads us right into our other example, um, which is Lark Rise to Candleford. I don't think that's even Masterpiece. It's the yeah, BBC, it's, though. I don't think it is. It's the BBC, and it's a fantastic show. So good. Very great. Another great example of small-scale, very intimate cast. Actually, it's a pretty large cast as it goes on. It's yeah. a good example of um, having small-scale storytelling with a large cast, but also staying really intimate with the main character because I feel like that show really successfully does that. You're yeah. following Laura Timmons and seeing her life as a girl growing up in the country and then moving to the city, the larger town, <laughs> city in quotations, um, to work at the post office with her aunt. And so, I mean, again, inciting incident, not big. Right. But it still pushes her outside her comfort zone. It pushes her outside her comfort zone. <laughs> because you see the comfort zone in the beginning, and you see, like, oh, she has, you know, this very comfortable life in her close-knit community, and then it's like, wow, this is kind of an opportunity for her, and her family sees it as an opportunity for her to be more successful and to, you know, further her education and her work life. Right. To really career. have a career of her yes, own. Yes, exactly. So yeah, that cool component of like, you know, she's a girl and in that time period, it wasn't necessarily like something all girls her age were doing, going out and like getting their own career. Right. But she has this opportunity. So again, like stay inside the comfort zone or like tackle this yeah. great opportunity exactly. I have in front of me, even though it's scary. Exactly. 
And, and I, that's actually an example of a show where I thought the first season like did more with sub characters that you didn't really care a whole lot about. There was a few episodes in there that were, like, focused a lot on sub-characters that were only there for, like, that one episode. But then, like, in season two, it started to focus more on, like... Yeah, it it is funny. The main characters. It's funny. When you watch the first season that, it's almost like the producers or whatever were like not really sure yeah, what they sure wanted to make of it yet but then yeah. like season two it's like whoa this is legit yeah exactly and then you get to really you're like it's almost like they they wanted to see who the viewers were going to care about the most and then like okay well let's just follow them because you exactly. end up caring the most about laura and miss lane and basically everything that happens to them exactly and their families right um and then, of course, there's some subplots in there that you care about the characters. But, yeah, season two is definitely my favorite. Yeah, I was show. just about to say season two is great. I feel like season three is good, too, but I can't really remember. I've, I want to rewatch some of it. But, yeah, that's another example of a small-scale story because as the show goes on, you don't have a lot happening. Like, even in some of the plots of the, st- of the, even some of the best episodes, it's like not much is really happening here. There isn't a lot of, like, adventure or peril, and the characters are still experiencing all of this internal conflict and just really interesting, intricate decisions and emotions that they have to battle with. Right. Um, that are brought about by these seemingly insignificant everyday events. Right. Like a package getting lost in the post office. Exactly. And, and there, like there you go, the just, whole episode yeah, and just how it episode. affects everybody. So right. that's what I love about it is because yeah, like, so you know, cool. it's small things, but yet we can relate to it because it's like everyday little stuff. Not everyone has these big giant... And like never like, feel... Disasters if happening you're, left and right. Right. You know, if, at least most of us yeah. like don't have right, to deal with exactly. that on an everyday basis. Right. So we have a hard time necessarily connecting to like, you know, um, <laughs> what do you call it? Like CGI farm or something. <laughs> CGI render farm? Yeah. Like we can't relate <laughs> to that. that. We, yeah. <laughs> I mean like, well, I think you do a great job of it in the blood race mm. and in all your books because there's a lot of like peril and adventure going on, but you always bring it back to like the really... The emotion, emotional, the thing behind internal the thing. conflict. Yeah, exactly. So and, even if it's a big scary event, we or something taking place in a fantasy world, we can right. still relate to the emotion behind it. Right, and but if you're a contemporary writer like me, um, or you write stories that you're like, oh, it's like it's not as exciting as yours because it's not a fantasy. Never think that because it can be just as in- exciting. I wrote a blog post one time that was like how to make a contemporary just as exciting as an otherworldly adventure. And I love that post because it goes over like the three-act story structure and how to change those, kind of redefine those story beats for yourself and see like, oh, well, I can have a plot twist even if it doesn't seem like a twisty plot, which I'm going to make a video about soon. So stay tuned for that. But um, how to make a twist in a non-twisty plot. Yeah, it's it's going to be good. <laughs> but it really like any story, doesn't matter what the genre is, can be so compelling and so gripping and like so engaging because the characters are really what you're there for. Right. Not the stuff that's happening, but why the stuff that's happening matters to the characters. Yeah. Like just saying don't like, that, oh, here for this, stayed for that. For books to be came for the characters, stayed for the characters. Yeah, exactly. Like regardless, <laughs> exactly. regardless, it's not like oh, I came for the action adventure and then I ended up staying for the characters. Yeah. Nope. And if you came for the action adventure, then you just kind of want to be entertained for a few minutes, and then you probably won't remember it afterwards. Right. That's the thing about plot driven stories is that you probably won't remember the plot driven story later because it's like oh, what it well, why did it matter? Right. Uh, but if you make me feel something, <laughs> I don't know why it mattered. Right. But if, if you make me feel something and you make me connect with the character, then I'm always going to remember that. Right. Exactly. So it, it can be definitely something that's like very, and it's almost, I mean, I want to go, I want to say it's like more creative because I think some, there are so many fantasy writers out there and you included who are so creative with what they come up with because it can be, you know, the, the sky's the limit. But when you're working within the confines of real life um, and even like, a very small scale story. That can be a fun challenge, actually, to challenge yourself to, I want to write a story, not me personally, but just like, this is an example. <laughs> I want to write a story that, you know, takes place in one room with 
three characters, a husband, a wife, and a son, teenage son. How can I make that interesting? Like, let's say they're locked in this room for the entire story. I don't care how long the story is. It could be a novel, short story, whatever. But like, how can you make that interesting? Like now that becomes like, it kind of, it, it challenges your creativity in a way that making up all these, you know, fight scenes and explosions and chase scenes and stuff doesn't challenge you because it can challenge you to be like creative with descriptions and stuff. But the other thing, the small scale thing, the family locked in a room can be more challenging, possibly more challenging than making up a big adventurous, you know, fantasy or something or sci-fi because it forces you to really dig deep and ask yourself important questions about what really makes this compelling. How are the characters going to resonate with the audience, you know? Right. Which you can bring that into fantasy, absolutely, and into sci-fi. And that's what makes sci-fi and fantasy, like, incredible. When it's done incredibly, it is incredible. Right. But when it's not, it's like, ugh, this is just, like, it's lackluster and it is just a bunch of action and shininess that you get caught up in because we are uh, wired, our brains are wired to notice that which is strange. Right. (laughs) Right. And... Uh, full of explosions, right? You kind exactly. of just naturally look at explosions right. that are happening because uh, they're, they're different. Yeah, but now it's become it's so mainstream that it's like, okay, well, what's going to make it like, right. compelling? And that's another thing is start thinking about that now because the market is so oversaturated with just CGI, CGI, CGI that yeah. it's like you know eventually people are going to be numb to that yeah. and they're going to want something more. And you can be there with your great story to provide yeah. It'll that. It'll be timeless. Timeless. Yeah. 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 It's very cool. Exactly. So that's the Durrells and Corfu, Lark Rise to Kindleford. Love the fact that it's small inciting incidences. There are so many that we could have talked about. So guys. many. Oh we had gosh. a really hard time narrowing like, it how down to just are we gonna, these. You should have seen us trying to brainstorm it. We were like, oh, but this one. Yeah, but this one. Oh, yeah. but this one. Oh, I want to talk about this one too. <laughs> oh, that's a mini series. Should we do a separate one on mini series? Tell us if we should do a separate one on mini series because right. I'm all for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know we have a lot of mini series that we love too. We do. We really do. And hey, you know, if you take nothing else away from this, Take away the fact that watching films and also reading the scripts can help you yeah. to understand story and how it's conveyed better. Don't just shut down your mind and be like, well, that's a film. Why are they always talking about films when we're supposed to be writing novels? A story is a story, a is, story a is a story. A story is a story is a story. Hey. And some of Everything you, is written down. Some of you are, who are listening are screenwriters. Ooh. Hey, that's an art form. That's yeah. your that's a writer. So, you know, exactly. Abby does some, has I do been screenwriting yeah. and so, uh, I want to, I don't do enough yet to call myself like I'm a screenwriter to introduce myself as a screenwriter, but I definitely do some screenwriting and right. I want to do more of it this year and really dig more into that because I so enjoy it, you know, right. really a fil- I feel like a filmmaker at heart and yeah. I feel like a film is such a compelling way to deliver a story. It yeah. is a hundred percent and it's an art form, it is storytelling and it can help you even if you are writing a novel, it can help you write your novel better because it helps you to observe how you're connecting with the character, why it matters, what is it that makes you feel the way you do after you watch a certain thing. What makes everyone love Downton Abbey so much? Then just case study it. Yeah, I I love that, man. Case study. All right, (laughs) let's look at Anna and Bates' relationship. Why do we care so much about it? And let's case study it and puzzle it out like a mystery. And we figure out like, ooh, now I I get why I connect so much with that sub-character. Yeah. So there's so many hidden treasures you can find in shows like this. I mean, we just hit on a few like Poldark, Dunton Abbey, The Selfridge, The Durrells in Corfu, Lark Rise. But there's so many more. Yeah, there are. So many more. But hey, you know, I just said all those names for your benefit so that you can go look these up if you haven't watched them already because they're excellent examples of storytelling in film format that is not just loaded with CGI and distractions. It's really real raw storytelling stuff that will help you understand character development, emotions, and just, I think, inspire the heck out of you to go write an awesome story yourself. Yes, absolutely. Definitely go 
Go watch all the things, do your homework, make notes, and have fun. Absolutely. So thank you guys for joining us for this episode. It's the first one that we've done, kind of like dissecting yeah. some movies. We're definitely going to do more And like fil- film related. And some that will just like focus on like one. Yeah story and then like dig yeah this one's was kind of like this was like a little sample platter this is like the box of chocolates that you get yeah that's like you don't necessarily know you're not going to like a specialty chocolate place to be like oh give me just these kinds you're getting like the little sampler box that has like a little bit of everything so you yeah. can kind of be like, hmm, this is, ah, I like exactly. that too. I like this too. So, <laughs> but th- yeah, go this watch is your the shows sampler, because yeah. we'll probably talk d- more about them like in future episodes, may even like just take one and dissect it like pull dark or whatever. Yeah. hundred um, percent. So you want to be educated on that before we do that. Exactly. So go watch the shows, have fun and, um. Yeah, what, are you, what were you going to say? I was going to say, if you're watching on YouTube, comment below if you've seen any of them. Tell us yes. which ones you've seen and what you think of them. And yes. if you're listening to this on any other medium, podcast medium, shoot us an email. Let us know what you think. Let us know if you've seen any. We would love to hear from you. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, follow us on social media and all that stuff, you can do so. It, all of that's in the description down below. If you're listening, you can find us on our Patreon pages and find all the links there too. Um, Patreon.com slash Emmons and Patreon.com slash Abby Emmons. And you can find us there as well as tons of stuff about the podcast. If you want to watch the podcast, if you're listening to it and you're like, hey, I want to check out, you know, what they're doing on YouTube and see their goofy faces, go do so. It is, <laughs> it lives on my YouTube channel. Um, which is youtube.com slash Kay Emmons. And my YouTube, if you're interested. <laughs> Go check it out. Writer's Life Wednesdays, man. Yes. YouTube.com slash Abby Emmons. A-B-B-I-E-E-M-M-O-N-S. There you have it. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining us for episode three. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you got something out of it. We'll see you in the next episode. Stay stoked. Rock on. Rock on.